Okay. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Into ETV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is John Mathis, and he's going to tell us about his near death experience. Hi, John. Hey, how are you doing? Good. So uh, start wherever you like and take as long as you like. Okay. Uh, what, is that a challenge or a threat? <laughs> <Both>. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, keep me from going too far into the weeds, but, uh, you know, here we go. Um, okay. uh, so in uh, 2005, I was married and my wife traveled for work. So Monday through Thursday, I was playing Mr. Mom and running a business from home and going to nursing school. So burn the candle both ends and uh, developed pneumonia, ignored it and got really, really sick. Finally went to a doc in the box and uh, they did an x-ray on me and said, uh, wow, you've got fluid in uh, all five of your lobes of your lungs. So you should probably go to the hospital. And I said, well, I'm going to go see my doctor tomorrow. Okay, good. So I didn't go to the doctor. I went to my endocrinologist. Um, but they had my x-rays and she was like, what are you doing here? You need to be in the hospital. I'm directly admitting you, you know, do not pass go, do not collect $200, go. Okay. So I didn't. Uh, I went back home and had myself a proper English breakfast, uh, eggs and toast and bacon and uh, good strong coffee. Cause I, I've worked in a hospital before and the coffee at the hospital to be generous would be like dipping a brown crayon in hot water. So I wanted, you know, if I'm going to be in the hospital for a few days, I, I want to have a you know, good breakfast. So somewhere between breakfast and driving around the parking lot looking for a place to park, I have no memories. I just was there. And then the next thing I know is I'm in the emergency room. Somehow my wife is there and they are handing me a piece of paper and I'm looking at the paper like I have no idea what you're doing. So finally, the doctor put a big X and then drew a line next to it. I'm like, ah, okay, you need me to sign this. Okay, so I signed it. And then that's when I lost consciousness. The Clinically, what they do is then when you hit a 90% oxygen saturation, that's when they put that little nasal cannula or that little hoop around your nose. Um when they did my oxygen sat, I believe it was uh, 64 or 68%. So they have no idea why I was even conscious to get to the hospital, let alone, you know, there. Luckily, my, my wife was there and what they wanted to do is they wanted to do a tracheotomy because they couldn't intubate me. Um, I'm a little thinner now, but uh, I had a 19 and a half inch neck and um, had sung opera previously. And so my wife's like, don't do that to him because he sings opera. So they took a little extra time, but they finally got me intubated. So it was breathing through, you know, the mouth as opposed to the neck, but that began the ordeal. And so clinically, uh, for 13 days, I was in a medically induced coma. While I was in my coma, the lungs failed, the kidneys failed and the heart tried to stop. If your organs are going to take a vacation, I suggest being in a hospital when that happens because they've got the equipment to kind of plug in. Um, for those of a certain age, you might remember uh, Monty Python where they talk about they have got the machine that goes bing over in the corner. Uh, so I was hooked up to all the machines that went bing. But uh, so I was on a respirator and uh, they also had me taking fluids for kidney failure. And my kidney stopped, so I blew up to about 420 pounds. Uh, I had third spacing, so in between layers of your skin, uh, fluid can collect. Uh, I had what looked like sweat or bloody sweat. That's actually called weeping edema. And I also had third spacing in my eyeballs. 
so pretty close to being uh, you know dead the heart then sensed the fluid overload i think and so the top of my heart or the atrium stopped and the ventricles or the bottom of the heart that's the important stuff uh this is where it gets a little curious more curious perhaps it turns out i had a birth defect i had a small um battery if you will the heart has two batteries the one to power the top the av node and the uh or the and the sa node and the av node which you know pumps the ventricle if i remember correctly i actually had another cluster next to it that was much smaller but it decided to turn on and so i had a steady heartbeat of about 18 to 20 beats per minute so I'm not going to be running in any races, barely walking, I guess, with that kind of heart rate. But it was enough to keep me alive and to keep oxygen to my brain. That went on for several days. They kept trying to figure out why I was sick. And they ran all these blood tests and nothing was coming back. There was no clinical reason for me to be in respiratory failure and renal failure and nearly heart failure. So they're throwing the kitchen sink at me and they're looking at really exotic stuff, even um, a Legionnaire's disease. I mean, they were really kind of trying to figure it out. But even though they didn't know what made me sick, what was even more confusing is they don't know what made me better. Because again, they were throwing everything at me, but then all of a sudden the heart kind of resynchronized and everything came back online. Then a day or so later, the kidneys came back online and so was able to get all those fluids off of me and then once those fluid levels kind of you know settled down then it allowed the the lungs and, and the heart to be kind of more normalized so all told i was in a coma for 13 days i was hospitalized for 29 and those other days were basically me getting reconditioned uh, I lost fine motor skills, so I had to relearn how to write again. Um, the inner ear is always moving, and so it's all the time trying to find equilibrium and balance. But when you're laying in bed for a couple of weeks, that isn't stimulated. And so just sitting up in a chair felt like riding a roller coaster. I, I literally kind of locked my arms around the arms of the chair to keep myself from falling out. Um, but once I got my strength and a little more conditioning and got that back, then I was able to, uh, come back home and catch up with my, um, classmates because I was in a weed out class for a uh, nursing school. I think there was like, you know, 400 applicants and only, you know, 18 places open. So it was a, a competitive type class. Uh, ironically enough, it was advanced anatomy phys, and where I had left the group was when we just started to study the lungs. Uh, so that information would have been really helpful if I'd been in class maybe just a couple more weeks to understand what was going on with my lungs at the time. But everyone kept telling me, because you have no idea how lucky you are. And I would come to find out later that for many, many reasons, I should have been dead and wasn't. To this day, they still don't know why I got sick or why I got better. What was curious though, is that uh, my marriage at the time was pretty bad, uh, ended up getting divorced. But in my journal, I saw this years later, a couple of days before the coma, I'd actually written in my journal, I wish I could just fall asleep and wake up and this all be over with. Yeah. I should have wished for lottery tickets <laughs> instead of that. <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna get yeah, gifted listening. something, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. You got to be careful when you ask the universe for stuff because you may get it. Um, so that's the clinical side of what happened. Uh, the metaphysical side of it is also interesting. Um, a lot of people have a near-death experience and they come back with all these kind of metaphysical um, attributes. Uh, some are psychic, some, you know, have some sort of clear audience, clear sentient. They, you know, they have the clairs type of thing. I did it bass backwards. Uh, I started speaking with ghosts when I was nine. Uh, I started remote viewing when I was 14. 
uh, started having out of body experiences, uh, a Reiki turned on uh, around uh, 30 years old. And this happened when I was 39. So I already had some metaphysical things kind of on and, and working for me prior to the near death experience. What happened after the near death experience is that all that stuff got dialed up. Um, if people are familiar with Reiki, it's, you know, it's an energetic, complementary alternative medicine uh, where basically you're pulling chi out of the universe through you and out to somebody else for them to use. When I did that, my, my hands would get like beat red and they'd warm up. Uh, and sometimes I'd get like a flush along the side of my neck when I was, you know, getting warmed up type of thing. After the near death experience, I'd say probably for about three to five months, when I would do Reiki, uh, again, you're just sitting still and putting your hands over the top of, you know, somebody's, you know, chakra center or just over the, the person themselves. Um, I would have to travel with another shirt. Because when I was doing Reiki, my body got so warm, I would sweat so profusely that my shirt would be saturated. It's almost like I'd taken a shirt out of the washer directly and put it on. It was that drenched. I even had people next to me when I would do Reiki shares. Just, you know, I had one lady just startled. She's like, oh, my God, could you feel this guy? <laughs> I was like, in another context, I don't know if I'd really want to hear that. <laughs> but it just is what it is. Uh, I had some other curious things as well afterward. But uh, while I was in the hospital in a coma, I still had full consciousness. And I think it was because I had already learned what it felt like to have my consciousness separate from my physical body, from the remote viewing and uh, astral projection that I'd been doing before the near-death experience. So while I'm in the coma, my consciousness is actually perched about six feet above my head. It's like I'm stuck to the ceiling. And so I can kind of like scan the room and look around. And, and of course, I'm just, I'm enjoying the situation. I have no concern about my physical health whatsoever. But in the hospital room, and you can imagine it's a small room in the ICU, but in one corner of the room is my wife at the time. And in the opposite corner of the room is my mom, who they flew up from Florida to be in Indiana to be by my bedside because, you know, I'm probably checking out. But they did not like each other at all. Oh. And so they're in the room and they're as far apart as they can get <laughs> in the room, but still be in the room. And so I'm just like checking in with the energy. And it's like, I really hate that I got to be in this room with her. But by God, I'm not going to leave this room. And they're both thinking the same thing. And I was just laughing my butt off because like, you guys are so similar and you don't know it. You're thinking the same thoughts and you don't know it. So I'm, I'm enjoying the, the, uh, the comic opera of me being in a coma. And it wasn't until, you know, maybe four or five days into the coma that, you know, I'm, you know, people are coming and going and doctors and nurses and whatever, but every once in a while family members would show up or friends or whatever. And I, I check in with them. But it was when my mom, who was in a wheelchair at the time, they, when they flew her up from Florida to be at my bedside, I was like, hmm, there might be something seriously wrong with me. But the next one I had was that my wife's cousin's wife had stage four cancer. And she came to see me. And I'm like, I must be really friggin' sick. <laughs> if the lady with stage four cancer is holding my hand and tearfully saying goodbye, I must be the one leaving. Holy shit. <laughs> I must be sick. But I didn't feel it. Uh, so that's when I was like, okay, maybe I need to uh, start thinking about an exit strategy. You know, wh what, what should I be doing? So that's when I started following the nurses. And so, again, my consciousness is hovering above my body, but the nurses would come in and do their thing, but they'd walk outside and literally 10 steps would be the nurse's station. So I'd follow them out to the nurse's station. And again, I was trying to get into nursing school. I'd already been working in a hospital for a few years. Uh, I was doing patient transport and assisting with physical therapy treatments. So I had some clinical knowledge. 
But while I'm at the nurse's station, they're saying things like, we need to make sure that his next of kin is updated. We need to make sure that his DNR is in place, that do not resuscitate. Uh, we need to uh, contact um, a pastor. Um, those things were concerning, but if you'll excuse the parlance, nurses sometimes have a phrase for people when they're not doing well. Uh, and it's dark humor but we call it circling the drain. And so when one nurse told another nurse, yeah, he's really circling the drain. That's when I knew, all right, I'm probably toast at this point, but wasn't. So people were coming and going. Um, and I had some, um, I was able to provide veridical experience or uh, proof that I was conscious. So there was a debate on what music should we have him listen to? And so they finally settled on James Taylor. Then my daughter, I think she was like 14, 15 at the time. She wanted to put barrettes in my hair uh, and paint my toenails. And so discussions like that, when I came back, it was like, how do you know that you were in a coma? And I'm like, well, my body was in a coma, but I was aware of what was going on. Uh, so that was curious to a lot of folks. Um, and my family is kind of split down the middle. The, some of them are Catholic and some of them are Southern Baptist, but neither one of them are really accepting of, yeah, I, you know, had a, had a sit down and a chat with God. Uh, I literally had a come to Jesus, you know, moment type of thing. Um, but in that space, saw the comings and goings, saw that, I oh, maybe I really am sick, and then decided, yeah, I, I, I want to stick around. So, again, after about 14 days, things started turning on again, and they could start taking me off the machines that kept me alive and kind of get me over the hump. I finally ended up discharged from ICU to a step-down unit. And the only thing they had on me was supplementary oxygen. They had the nasal cannula, the little you know lasso of oxygen. And as I'm lying there staring at the ceiling, counting the holes in the different tiles and wondering what the hell just happened to me, I had this thought, this is probably as close as I will ever get to a near-death experience without actually dying uh, you know, and tripping over the threshold. Uh, and so I was kind of disappointed that I hadn't had a near-death experience. And so I fell asleep and I had a near-death experience. Hmm. So I went through the tunnel in a room of bright light. In this bright light, uh, there's nothing. And all of a sudden, this very, very pure, bright white light showed up within this room of white. And I couldn't tell if it was a speck a million miles away, uh, if it was a sun a billion miles away. There was just no frame of reference. There was just something there. And so I wondered, what is that? And now I was into the thought and not the physicality. And so as soon as I thought, what is that? Boom, it's right in front of me. And I said, what are you? And it replied, I'm everything. And this probably speaks to my personality. My response was, well, that's pretty cool. Uh, so then this little tendril of like fiber optics cable, it was white and kind of milky. And I could see like electricity or light flowing through it but like really slowly reached out and like boop, hit me there in the third eye. I got boop. <laughs> and instantly there was like this explosion of light inside my head and this download of information. And then it stopped. And so there was kind of two kind of like jolting sensations. One of this information push, but secondly, then the stop. And it was almost like a whiplash type of feeling. And in, in my mind, I heard another voice said, 
are you okay? I'm like, yeah. And then it was like, whoever that voice is kind of like turned around and said, okay, he can take more. And so, boom, another push of light. And to kind of quantify this, the first push of light was like a flash bulb, like the 1940s and 50s cameras where they had like the bulb inside the aluminum housing and, you know, the flash and then the bulb is burned out. That was the first round. The second round was like standing in front of a spotlight uh, at the airport or, you know, at a mall opening or something. The third one was the equivalent of a magnesium fire. It was, there really aren't words in human language, but to give it some sort of context, uh, that's the story I've come up with. And after these three flashes, it was like, it's like they energized me or brought my energy level up to a place where we could freely communicate. And at that point, it was weird. I mean, it was weird up to that point, but now it got even more weird. I'm standing on a soccer field. But then I find out later, it's not a soccer field. It's a Quidditch pitch. So if you're a Harry Potter fan, you know about, you know, Quidditch, the game. Um, and if you're not, I'll use the soccer metaphor. But I'm in a stadium setting on a soccer pitch in the middle of the field. The stadium go, the seating goes all around me, and the stadium seats go all the way up into the clouds. And there are people there of every imagination, every race, every generation, every era. Uh, some weren't even people. Some of them looked like oval boogie boards or surfboards, and they were just energetic, light, opalescent presence. Standing next to a guy with a toga and standing next to a lady in, you know, 18th century, you know, with a high neck type of dress. Standing next to me is the comedian George Carlin. And he was my Sherpa for my entire near-death experience. Now, the curious thing is that George Carlin wasn't dead. My near-death experience was in 05 and George Carlin died in 09. So... Who that really was is still one of my mental chew toys. I still think about that. Um, was it George's higher self? Uh, was it a uh, extraterrestrial being who spelunked my brain and said, oh, this is someone we can show him and he won't freak out? Or was it a deity? You know, was it the original OG? You know, was it God? I don't know. But it total had this the total vibe of George Carlin. It wasn't like, behold, welcome to heaven and the majesty that is herein. It was more like, dude, there's some crazy shit up here and I can't wait to show you. And I'm like, come on, bring it on. Let's go see this stuff. And so he looks out at the crowd. He goes, hey, everybody, this is John. And the whole crowd is like, hi, John. And he says, and John is from Earth. And the whole place goes, ooh. I'm like, ooh, who really? I'm I'm in heaven, and you're ooing about Earth. I, I I don't get it. And immediately, this wave of information comes at me. Earth is hard. Earth is a master class. There are some souls that will not go to Earth because it's hard. Uh, there are people that will observe what's going on on earth they will periodically tap into individuals that are on earth but they will not incarnate here because you can get hurt and i was surprised by there's actually some place where heavenly beings say now nah, I'll, I'll take a pass on that um, but that's when i got um more specific they said earth is a master class and you have to have achieved a certain level of spiritual awareness and integrity before you're even allowed access to earth. And so I'm like, so you're telling me everyone on earth is a spiritual master? Yep. And I'm like, are you telling me Mother Teresa and Hitler are, are basically at the same level? And they're like, yep. And of course, you know, cognitive dissonance on that. And they're just like, 
in order for you to have a hero, you need a villain. And sometimes to motivate humanity, it takes a villain to motivate humanity and not a hero. And immediately, I don't know, again, I don't know if they pushed this thought into my head or if I came up with this on my own. But then I thought of Jesus and it was like, you know, if Jesus had to write a Yelp review of his time on earth, I'm pretty sure it would have got just one star. <laughs> um, maybe a star of David, but still just one star. Uh, it, 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 he didn't have a good experience. And so that that has always traveled with me since my near-death experience in that no matter who I meet, it, the person that cuts me off in traffic or the person who donates an organ, they're both spiritual masters because you needed to have hit that criteria just to be here. But part of the fun of this playground is that you have to forget who you are and what you know in order to play the game. And that's when I give talks, I try to compare it to a video game. You know, you may go out and buy a video game and play one character at one difficulty level and use one, you know, tool or weapon. And as you go through and win the game, do you just throw away the game? No, you typically go back and it's like, well, let me play it at a harder level. Let me take a different path. Let me choose a different tool. Let me choose a different character. And so you fully explore the potential of that game. And that's what's going on here. We come into this game and we explore and we try different things. Um, another way I, I've described it in the past is like, uh, I didn't know what the term Akashic Records were. Uh, so I was using my own term. I called it the cosmic Costco. And I said that, you know, while you're over there uh, in heaven or whatever, and you're getting ready to, you know, do, uh, you know, your uh, vacation planning, you know, you work with your guardian angel, your cruise director, or, you know, whoever. And it's like, okay, this time I want to try this, but I don't want to try that. And I think I could do this thing better. And, oh, I haven't tried that yet. And so you're going through and selecting the things that are going to stretch you as a soul and and kind of round you out. But also kind of like a video game, you want to go back and play certain aspects that I think I could do better. You know, I could score better or whatever. And as you kind of put together this whole kind of package, someone else is in the background kind of picking out a meat suit that will meet your criteria. So I had a very specific thing that I wanted to work on. And I discovered later after my near-death experience, I did some past life regression work. Uh, I spontaneously discovered four lives. And then later I worked with someone else to discover 10 more lives. All of these lifetimes had a theme going through them, working on rejection and abandonment. And when I learned that, when I looked at this lifetime, this family history, this dynamic, it was like, I set myself up perfectly for these things, to learn these things. And so the, the, the questions that I had, first of all, was what is a near-death experience? And I had both subjective and objective. And while I had certain things that seemed true as I was reading, going through a tunnel, seeing a bright light, seeing a deity, having a past life review, getting a download, uh, coming back, uh, feeling compelled to try to make the world a better place, having different skill sets and things turn on. Uh, I fit the criteria. But at the same time, I was also I was like, in no place did I see George Carlin in any of the literature. In no place did I see exploring heaven and heaven actually to me look like a snowflake made out of crystal or a crystalline structure. And at every point in that snowflake where things joined and then branched out into other directions was a very specific action or decision in my lifetime, which then set forth the cascade of other options and other opportunities. But the snowflake started really small. Here's mom and dad. Here are my grandparents. Here's my best friend. Here's my dog. But each one of those had a nexus point where I had made a decision and that opened up other opportunities. So I didn't go to this college. I went to that college. I didn't, I didn't make friends with this person, but with this friend. And so I was able to basically within an instant 
explore this entire crystalline snowflake structure, see the choices that I made, see how those choices affected the people who were part of that decision, and experience their feelings and, and their emotions from that nexus point. And so when I came back, it was like, now I understand that connectivity that everyone talks about, that we're all interconnected energetically. Uh, and as I read up more and more over time, um, quantum theory and quantum mechanics really kind of helped me kind of figure out we may look separate from another person or a tree or a rock, but energetically, we're not energetically we're all connected at a quantum level and so you know maybe the shaman who had no idea what quantum mechanics are and weren't scientists and didn't have degrees uh they came at the knowledge from a different track but it's still the same knowledge and so that's what i spent you know from 2005 to now is just going back and forth between what's the woo woo what's the science and is there a way for me to bridge that gap because in my day job, I'm a clinical data scientist. I'm doing clinical research for new drugs coming to market. Um, my clients were uh, Pfizer, Merck, Lilly, Knoll, Shearing Plow, and you know millions of dollars worth of research were going through my fingertips. There's no way I could tell these folks, yeah, I'm sure this is at a quantum level. When I was in a near-death experience, I saw how this is all interconnected. And don't worry, this drug will be fine. You know, I'll, I'm going to be in a rubber room, you know, chasing corners. You know, so there was an aspect of that that I had to keep to myself. But I also built up that wall at, during my childhood. When I was nine and I'm trying to tell my parents, I just saw my deceased grandfather. My Southern Baptist father's response was to beat me with a belt and say that I was lying. And my mom's response was, let's bring the Catholic priest home for dinner and remind him what is a good Catholic. Mm -hmm. So I already knew how to compartmentalize and put things in boxes and, and just keep things to myself. And every once in a while, I was like, if I'm, if I'm at an NDE silo conference talk, then I'll talk specifically to NDEs. If I'm in paranormal research uh, and seeing ghosts and, you know, at a location, then I talk specifically about ghosts. But it wasn't until my near-death experience that all these little silos that I would built for myself just got creeped. It was like a tornado went through. And so I, the lesson was energy is energy. And how the human animal is able to bring that energy in and filter it through their experiences and then manifest it into something into physical realm that's going to be unique for each person and that's why some people can touch objects and pick up their history why some people are really good at reiki just like some people are really good at playing the piano and other people are really good writers we have these innate skills that may have been brought up through genetic heritage may have been from our ancestors, I may just have natural predilections or educa education that we've picked up along the way. All of that kind of brought back to the near-death experience. I spent 05 to 07 wishing I could just go back. 7 to 11, realizing that I'm not the only one that this happens to, there's a corpus of knowledge out there, and I want to bring that knowledge in because, again, the data manager of me is like, I want all the data, all the data I can get into, and then look for trends. And where am I, where am I like others, and where am I different from others? In 2011, I reached out to a group called IONS, and I said, uh, in case you don't know, uh, International Association for Near-Death Studies. I reached out to them, I said, hey, I'm a near-death experiencer. I also have to be a clinical data scientist. Um, do you guys have a database that I can look at? Or would you like me to build you one? And they said, yes, please. Uh, so I signed an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. And I had about 200 case studies. And I went through and I built a database for them. 
And in that process, I learned more about near-death experience and realized uh, I hadn't broken my brain. After all, I am just part of a subset of humanity that's had some exceptional experiences. And I'm to the point now where it's like, I don't even know if I want to call it. Um, it's not really exceptional. It's just different. Because these things have been going on as long as people have been painting on walls, I think. Um, there has been a spiritual nature to the human animal. And I think we've gotten disassociated from that with, you know, technology and whatever. And sometimes I think the near death experience is a reminder of that there is a spiritual self as well as a physical self and a consciousness self. Um, so where this is taking me to now is between 11 and 15, I participated in IONS, went to the meetings, went to the conferences, um, tried to educate myself to this paradigm which then led me to some other places. It led me to just out of body experiences in general to which near death experiences fall under, but so do spiritually transformative experiences. Uh, so does remote viewing, astral projection. Um, and again, the more I dug at it, it was like, there's a lot of humanity going through this and they call it by different names, but it got to the point where I'm like, what is going on? Why is this happening to so many people? And why is there almost a formula to a near-death experience? And so then I really started digging at it. And then I had my epiphany um, a couple years ago. We have these clinical trials that will run sometimes 10, 20 years. And we call them registry trials. And for example... There is a, uh, a trial that was out there. I think it ran for about 10, 15 years, and they were following nurses, and they were following smokers. And they wanted to find out, you know, basically, yes, we know smoking causes cancer, but what type of cancers? How long till symptoms show up? How long until you're diagnosed? So a little more granularity in that data. Take that scenario. And imagine you've written a protocol where it's like, I want to follow people for 20 years who are smokers and chewers of you know, tobacco. And say I wrote this in you know, 2001. Well, maybe 2008, 2009, something comes along called vaping. Whole new delivery system, not thought of in the original protocol, the original plan. And so the risk you have is now I've got this other vector coming in. Do I tell everybody in the study, hey, there's this new vector and we want to collect the data on just vaping? If there are people in the trial that don't know about vaping and I introduce them to it, well, now I've affected the data. So... What you'll do sometimes is if people come to the study driver or physician and say, hey, you know, I started vaping, then what you do is you pull that person aside and say, okay, we're going to give you a different set of rules. Not only are we going to track chewing and smoking, but now for you, we're going to track vaping. And so you give them a little education, you tell them how you're going to track them, you give them some new paperwork, and you put them right back out there into the world but you don't tell everybody else. And at the end of that study, you find the people that never discovered vaping and you've got your pure data because they still stuck to the original premise of the study. With all that being said, what if humanity is a clinical trial? And what if it isn't running 20 years, let's say it's running 200,000 years? And what if humanity as an experiment is getting off the rails? Um, the data has a wobble in it that we didn't anticipate, like vaping. So what do we do? We don't erase the study. Someone say Noah's flood might be one of those erasures. But 
for those people who have identified themselves, we pluck them out of the study, we give them that little bit of training, we give them a download of information, and then we drop them back in. What if there's a clinical trial called Humanity, someone, ones, are watching the study, don't like what's going on, and so they're finding the people who can make a difference, pulling them out, giving them a download and putting them back in to try to rescue the rest of the study. Well, I've got when one you for look you. At the Go ahead. Sorry. I did a little poll on um, NDE Facebook groups a few years ago, several times, and it always come out about the same, that eighty around 85% of near-death experiencers are negative blood. Okay. Uh, I've heard there's an association between near-death experiencers and negative blood. Did you? But that's all okay. I remember. It was a fact that like, cut in the, the brain. The positive blood near-death experiencers got real mad and defensive, started saying I was saying they didn't have an NDE, and I was separating people, and I was doing this and that. I said, I'm just asking a question. If right, you had right. an NDE, well, what's your blood type? So that was it. And, and and I don't I don't fit into that criteria because I'm B positive. Okay. So I, I, I don't know the rationale behind it, but I heard that there was a correlation. But the, the, they have a saying it's a there's a correlation, but the correlation is not necessarily causation. Um, you know, if it's if it's sunny outside and I see somebody eating an ice cream, the sun didn't create the ice cream. There is a correlation but it isn't causation. So I'm all the time, again, when I'm playing around with data, I mean, that's all I do all day long is I'm trying to find correlations. And is that correlation causation or is it just interesting? Uh, looking at people who have been abducted, near-death experiences, and the spiritually transformative experience, Looking at those subsets of people, they have some very interesting similarities in that they're living a normal life. They are pulled out of that normal life. They are giving a download of information and they're dropped back into reality. And those folks tend to go through the same grieving process or accommodation or uh, I called it re-entry turbulence for a while but you come back and my wife doesn't under or my spouse doesn't understand me my job doesn't make sense anymore my religion is a sham um, commercials on TV are so blatantly bullshit you you basically end up overwriting your entire previous life and i had all those things happen to me I, I jokingly told people for a while that i was my own witness relocation program because mm -hmm. i moved to a new state new town started a new industry left my religion left my wife left my job left my business control all delete on my entire life and a lot but of divorces if, if after nde yeah yeah because again the and so let's spin this 180 degrees when i met the woman who would be my wife she met a guy who grew up as a welfare kid and was motivated by money and by letters behind his name and so as a single mom hitching your cart to that type of guy is a good hitch and we had some things we went to college together I was a, a music and English major. She was a theater and psych major. And so whenever there were musicals, we, you know, had our shared time together. So we had a lot of similarities. But at the same time, when you're trying to decide who I want to spend the rest of my life with, here's a guy that's motivated to be a good provider, uh, challenge himself intellectually and emotionally. Um, so, yeah, why wouldn't you want to connect to that? But I had a near-death experience, and when I came back, I had a new operating system. 
uh, a new OS, and uh, which I now call my uh, uh, obstinate spirituality. That so here's one example. We didn't have a honeymoon. We saved our money, and it was maybe two years, uh, four years into the marriage. We decided we were going to spend the entire summer in Europe touring the castles that were in the Harry Potter movies. When I came back, I floated an idea. I said, hey, you know all that money we put back for the vacation? How about if we buy medical supplies, drive them out to the Four Corners area of the United States where all these reservations are, where there's terrible health care, rampant alcoholism, rampant diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Now let's help these folks. I'm not sure this is a verbatim response, but the, the energy was, who the fuck are you? Yeah. <laughs> so from her perspective, she married a very specific individual with different skill sets and different drivers. He literally went into the hospital and came out a month later completely different. I no longer wanted a six-figure salary. I wanted to go back to school and be a nurse. I didn't want more letters behind my name. I wanted to serve humanity. And yeah, so a lot of divorces, I understand that because the person who you were and the person who you are is traumatically different. And when you take those wedding vows and sickness and health, usually a sickness is something that is progressive and it's not startling uh, and something that happens overnight. The other thing too, is that for about the first two years after I was back, I was pretty useless. Um, again, I was craving heaven or whatever that was. I wanted to go back. Uh, I could barely uh, keep up with schoolwork and just managing the house. Um, again, while the wife traveled and playing Mr. Mom, but all those other drivers that I had, they weren't there. And I spent a lot of time journaling and trying to figure out what the hell just happened to me. Why am I so different? And what am I supposed to do with this new self? Um, the other thing that was going on, these were very temporary, but the other thing that was going on too, is that electrical devices, they'd fritz on me, um, uh, uh, watches, they'd stop. Uh, when I walked under street lights, street lights would go off and on. Uh, if I walked under fluorescent lights, they kind of had a ballast. You ever seen those lights, the fluorescent lights, where it's like the ballast is bad, and so it's like they're tremoring. Yeah. They're not really lit up. I would walk under those lights, and they would start tremoring. So, I mean, I was a data scientist, and all this stuff is happening to me, and I don't understand it. And for a while, again, I was like, I must have broke my brain. I've, I've, I've dabbled so much in Reiki and remote viewing and astral projection and talking with ghosts. This is the beginning of going insane. That was one of those thoughts that stuck in my head for a very long time. And so the first couple of years, I, I was not a good partner. So from her perspective, I mean, yes, I mean, it's like buying a car and finding out it's a lemon. You know, it was, oh, this is, a, you know, a flood damaged vehicle we didn't tell you about. We rolled back the odometer. And by the way, it's missing its transmission. So to, to, to be fair to the other side of the equation, completely different person. But those folks go through a PTSD type of process. And we understand it now, like from being shell shocked during World War One, and then PTSD, I think, came around with Vietnam. Um, but we finally had a clinical application and treatment package, and we had a better understanding of it. But again, you as a human being, you have an experience that is unlike the rest of your set of people. Just like when a soldier goes to Vietnam or was in, or, you know, desert storm, a buddy steps on a landmine and one minute he's talking to you. The next minute he's red mist. 
veterans don't want to relive that trauma. Just like near-death experiencers for a while don't want to relive that trauma. And that's why either A, they don't talk about it, or B, there really aren't words. There's an ineffability, the inability to speak what happened because the words don't exist. And when the words come out of your mouth, you sound so foreign. Like, who am I saying these crazy things? But you know, to your core, it's true. But it's so, yep. it shakes you up to say that, say those words out loud. I went through a tunnel. I was in a bright light. I spoke to someone I believe was God. I spoke to someone I believe was Jesus. This is what happened. Because you know, because you're saying how people are going to look at you. What they're going to think. Yeah, and, and this is before the internet. At least now with the internet, you can reach out and find these groups. You can find IONS. You can find ASSIST. You can find ENDERF. Um, and then if you have the other associated things like you know, spontaneous out of body things. Well, there's so many other places now. There's uh, Saybrook Institute, there's the Rhine, there is um, a Salem, there's uh, Win Winbridge, I think, uh, Sophia University. There's now this explosion, comparatively speaking, of metaphysical education. And it has, it has left the world of woo and insanity. And now it's just, ah, you're a little granola. Eh, fruits, nuts, and flakes. Okay, I get it. Whatever. Um, it is still looked at a little cross-eyed, but you're not going to lose your job if you tell people you practice Reiki or you ghost hunt or speak to ghosts. You can turn on any cable TV station now and see these type of things. So it's penetrating the zeitgeist and it's becoming more acceptable. And the only way we continue that tangent is to keep doing what we're doing, doing things like you're doing, talking about it, getting it out there. And what is, what's going to happen, I hope, is that the experience of re-entry turbulence, that angst from the time that you come back to the time that you feel like, okay, I can re-energize and participate in the world again. That has, I've been told that average is about seven years. Can you imagine having any kind of depressive or suicidal tendencies and then having this traumatic event and then trying to write it out and white knuckle it for seven years? So, that has been my focus, I'd say, the past couple of years, I, literally the past two years, is how can I reach back to those folks who have had that experience and they're in that space of what the fuck do I do now? To create that space of you're not crazy, you didn't break your brain, you think it's unusual, but if you look at the numbers and look at all the different places that are popping up, you realize, one, it's not as unusual as you think, and two, it's almost like society is being changed because they're all popping up all over the place. So, that, I mean, if you go back 20 years ago, you wouldn't find these things. And if you went back 50 years ago, they would be incredibly hard. They were, you know, dark whispers. And if you went back 200 years ago, you'd burn at the stake or be called a heretic or be excommunicated. So... The trajectory has been slow, but there's one there. And so, so I, one of, one of my, uh, one of my pivots that was forced upon me, um, talk about anything you said. Okay. The last week of June of 2023, Tuesday. I'm up till one o'clock in the morning teaching coworkers in India about how we are using AI in pharmaceutical research programming. Wednesday, I get an award from HR for staying up until one o'clock in the morning and helping these 20 year olds who just graduated try to assimilate into our new company. Thursday, 
I get laid off. Mm. Wednesday night to Thursday morning, I wake up it's about 4.35 o'clock in the morning. Twilight hadn't quite arrived. And at the foot of my bed is Archangel Michael. Now, since my near-death experience in 2005, he pops in and out on occasion. But he's a cheeky bastard because he's actually been traveling with me my entire life. But he only decided to reveal himself to me in 2011. So I'm like, wait, all these other times and stuff is going on. That's been your hand. And he's got this little sheep, sheepish grin. Yeah, that's been me. <laughs> so one time I tried to clear a haunted house using Reiki. I've done it previously and did an okay job with it, but that was with human entities. I went into a haunted house where I encountered something that had never been human. It did not go well. Um, I felt myself being possessed. Archangel Michael shows up and he is in his business suit. <laughs> Uh, he's got this like bandolero of, of glowing jewels and lights around him. He's got, you know, these big, you know, 50 foot wingspan of wings out. He's got a flaming sword, uh, like, uh, the game of Thrones characters, you know, um, and he's there for business and whatever was trying to get inside me just scattered. The next day. I dream there's a knock at my door. So in my dream, I go and open my door. There's Archangel Michael. He comes in, he sits down. He's wearing a karate gi, like the white tunic top and the white pants. And he's got a black belt and he's wearing Birkenstocks. He sits down on my couch and he's like, so you're not going to do that shit again, are you? No, <laughs> I'm not going to do that shit again. He's like, okay, good talk. Well, Back to this past June. He's at the foot of my bed, wearing his karate gi. He looks at me, has a little sheepy, sheep grin, and he just goes, What? What time is it? Uh, it's time for something. And and again, he points to watch again, but this time I get to think, it's time. And I know what he means. It's time for me to start talking about the downloads that I got during my near-death experience. Because again, I try, I balked at it. I wanted to be the clinical data scientist. I wanted to be the breadwinner. I wanted to be a good husband and a good spouse. I was incapable of doing that with the new operating system that I have. But I fought it. And I'm stubborn. Um, but yeah, so Thursday morning when an archangel says it's time and Thursday afternoon you're let go without cause from your AI job. Uh, yeah, that's a come to Jesus moment. Uh, so that's why I was like, okay, well, if I have to reinvent myself, what am I going back to? And what do I need to do to honor the contract? And thus, I need to start talking about the near-death experience. So that night happened to be um, an IONS meeting. I hadn't been to an IONS meeting in probably seven years. But I showed up. That was June. July, um, I helped set up uh, and did the uh, AV work for the presentation. October. I was a guest speaker at the local IONS, and I just found out last week that I've been invited to speak at the national conference in Arizona. So I believe I'm now honoring that download. And if it's meant to be, then I don't know if you've, if you've ever experienced a flow state, the universe kind of puts out the red carpet you know you're in the flow state because things are easy. And since, I would say since July, August, just numerous opportunities have come up. Um, 
I was interviewed for a Canadian television show. Uh, I've got a YouTube channel. I've got a medium um, diary or journal that I keep out there, a metaphysical journal that I keep. Uh, and just other opportunities to speak and to share are just manifesting without me having to ask. They just show up. What's the and Canadian so that's how I know about? Uh, so the they had a uh, they had the last year's conference was in D.C. and I went to just visit and hang out and ended up uh, running into someone who was like, you know, you know, so why are you here? And told him that, you know, I, I, I'm an experiencer, but I also do research. And so I walk in both worlds and I'm, I'm here just gleaning information. And they said, well, what's, what, what's the cool thing about your near-death experience? I said, I saw George Carlin. You know, that usually gets the deer in the headlight look. And so I told him, I said, well, he wasn't dead, but that's what showed up and I really don't know if it was George, if it was not George, it was an extraterrestrial masquerading as George. Um, kind of like, uh, uh, what was that uh, Jodie Foster movie, Contact? You know, I don't know what it was, but I can tell you what its effect was on me and how it's shaped my world and, and how I move through it. And they're like, we want to interview you. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's how that, that happened. Where do you see um, near-death experience research going? Because it seems to me it's not going anywhere. You know, people are on into the stories, and that's as far as it gets. And they don't care if they're true or not. I have found that out. As long well, as it's entertaining. So, right. Well, I mean, who doesn't like a good story? And like the Irish proverb is, is don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. If that's all you're looking for, there's plenty of opportunity for that. Um, there's quite a few uh, reality shows that are engineered reality for our entertainment. Um, I think near-death experiences are just one fragment of a much larger experiment and picture going on. And if you want to just focus on the entertainment value, fine. Just like if you went to a George Carlin concert back in the day and you just wanted to hear dirty jokes and laugh, that's there. But if you really wanted to listen to what was being said and what was the topic and what was the lesson, that's when you discover that George Carlin was really like the old fashioned uh, court jester. And the fact that the court jester was the only one who could speak the truth to the king and not lose their tongue or their head because he did it in a way that was entertaining but still made his point. John Stewart has made a living out of doing that very same thing. A lot of other comedians as well. But I think what's going on is that the near-death experience is just, it's a microcosm of life. If you just want to go through life and have life happen to you, and all you do is respond to what occurs in your life, then that is your life experience. You can have that. But if you decide there is an aspect of life that I think I want to flex into, and I want to make this part of my life, part of my personality, part of my soul's patina, then that's what I'm going to reach out to. So for me, it was like, I, I know I had an experience and just enjoying the experience and, and having that experience and being part of that is unique and kind of interesting, but I wanted to know why. And so I followed that question. And now the why has got to how, how is it this formula can be applied to so many different types of people? If we're supposed to be unique, We've all had different races, different backgrounds, different education, different family, different stories. These are all lenses that shape our perception of reality. Why is it that it's almost like there's this collective consciousness writing in the background, uh, thank you, Jung, uh, that we all can kind of tap into? Because, you know, we're all or being told, 
you know, it's not our time or it is our time. Like I was told it was my time. The answer was no. Most people are told it's not your time. Who decides when our time is? What decides what our time is? What is this intelligence? Yes. And so that's, that is the who. Because once you start, once you go from, did this happen? Yes, no. Is it real? Yes, no. Then when you peel back that layer, then it's like, there's this formula here. Who designed the formula? Who is instigating the pickup? Who is deciding who gets picked out of the crowd? And who made these tunnels? Why? Yeah, so that's the, that's the hidden hand behind all of it, and and so that that's my propose that was my proposal to to Iance for uh, for speaking, is that we all talk about the paradigm. Why is it happening? And if we have a why, a rationale, then we have to have a person who is or an entity that is providing the reason. Okay, yeah, we're being plucked and, and we're being put back. And there seems to be a formulaic thing to that. Why is it happening and who decided why it needs to occur? That's where I'm at now. Hmm? It's only happened about 15%. Now, every time you die, do you have NDE? Every person that dies and comes back hasn't had an NDE. And it's only happened to 15%. You know, so... You know, why? Why did, you know, so like me, second one was tool pregnancy. A lot of women died of tool pregnancy. I had the biggest tool, tool pregnancy they ever saw. You know, why was I sent back? You know, why was you sent back? Why was any you know, of us? Why, why us? You know, like, and you would come back with that feeling we're different. We're somebody else and we're changed. We've, we've got a job to do. We can't just focus on the selfishness of our lives. We know we have a purpose. And it's up to us to fulfill that purpose. You know, I think that's why a lot of us write books. And, and and that's that's why I deliberately rejected. When I came back, it was like, this is so damn formulaic. You die, you come back, you write a book, you give a talk. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be just one more voice in that. And so what I did, I died, I come back, and I wrote a book. Except I didn't write a book about near-death experiences. I wrote a book about a grandson being bullied. And the parents' response was, you're going to live with grandpa for the summer. He's going to get you straight out. And grandpa was the introduction to metaphysics. And so what this book really is was a, a, a primer, uh, an introduction to all things metaphysical. So grandpa was a Reiki master. Grandpa had a near-death experience. Grandpa had done past life regression. And so I wrote this story of basically a grandson being mentored by the grandfather on all these metaphysical things. And he started to see the bully as someone who was just afraid. And this person was masking their fear by being a bully. And he met this bully later on with understanding and love. And the bully didn't know what to do with that. And it, it took a couple of attempts to finally the bully realized, I don't need to project this to you. And so they become friends. But in the process, there's all sorts of things. And again, I tried to think about like the George Carlin concert. Do you just want to read this about a kid who is being bullied? He gets some ideas. He puts those ideas into place. And now his life's better. Fine. But I also dropped some little nuggets along the way. Um, Grandpa's dogs are named Kuan Yin and Siddhartha. Grandpa has decorations in his cabin of Coca Pelli. Grandpa has uh, uh, kanji writings on the wall, and some of them are kanji writings, but some of them are Reiki symbols. And so, trying to introduce metaphysical thoughts and ideas in kids that are 14 to 16 years old that was what i was trying to do and it got picked up by a couple of school systems and so it's out there it's kind of doing its thing and that's fine uh kind of you know the johnny appleseed of metaphysics i guess um 
that bug bit me again a little later because as I was out selling that book, and I also created an organic skin cream for cancer survivors uh, with a little bit of wound care knowledge and a little bit of Reiki. But as I was out selling my cream and selling my book, I kept seeing certain things no matter where I went. There was a 35 to 65 year old college educated female with disposable income dragging along a male partner who looked like he was going to the vet for the second time was not happy was burying themselves in their phone or whatever trying not to be there and i thought if there's anybody who needs a kind of epiphany along the pathway of metaphysics it's joe sixpack and so then my second book came about it's called Guitar, Cigars, and Tiki Bars, A Guy's Guide to Spirituality. And it's basically two guys getting day drunk at a tiki bar. But they're talking about metaphysical experiences and how it changed their lives. And one of the reviewers said, uh, it's like uh, metaphysics with dick jokes. And I'm like, that's exactly what I was going for. So, you know, great. Thank, glad you noticed. Uh, but that's. I've, I've finally warmed up to the idea of, okay, I'll fall into the fold. Yes, I had my experience. Yes, I will talk about it. Yes, I will write about it. Um, but again, I believe the near-death experience is a puzzle piece to a much larger panorama. And I'm not sure, but right now, the right now I'm rationalizing as, this is a 200,000 year old study and there are extraterrestrials or extra dimensional beings, things that are not human so that they can live 200,000 years who are playing with humanity and experimenting with humanity. And if they see a wobble in the data, they are going to affect the trajectory of certain people's lives. And because they exist out, outside of time, you know, they may do something to me or you that doesn't really affect me or you, but it affects who we run into or who we may give birth to or a business we create or a book that we write. Again, being outside of time allows a lot of options to occur. Right now, I think that's what's going on. Now, whether that's angels intervening or whether that's extraterrestrials masquerading as angels, because that's something we will accept as a Judeo-Christian nation. I don't know the answer to that, but I know that I, I, I feel there is a hidden hand manipulating humanity and the near-death experience is just one way of many that humanity, humanity is being manipulated. Well, in the Bible, that's called God. <laughs> and, and so I'm, and I, I'm any, I've been given talks off and on since 2011. And I don't always speak to people who have a Judeo-Christian background. And I've also talked to people who have had a negative experience with Judeo-Christian background. Um, priest and molestation cases come to mind. So speaking to the situation and using God can sometimes be off-putting or even triggering to some folks. And so that's why I try to sidestep that word. A lot of people Because for do. some people... And the Ions community at Flat Out does not want people using that word. And um, yeah, there's a lot of... It seems like politics start to come into play and politics religion. are part of humanity and anything that is a human adventure is going to have politics it sucks and it's sad but it's the reality i had the same problem because when i first came into ions um i would say probably about 2012 um the group of people that i was involved with i think they wanted to hear angels and god and salvation and instead i was talking about george carlin the same guy who gave us the seven words you can't say on tv and who is so sacrilegious in some circumstances 
and was so political and so controversial. But if you want to change the trajectory of humanity, you have to be controversial because there's so much noise out there. How do you cut through the noise? I think George did that. And I think it's going to take a similar personality because with social media and all the other things that are going on, the 24 hour news cycle, it's even more noise. They, some, you said some want to change the trajectory of society. And I think NDEs are being used to do that. And one yeah. side is using it evidence. for one thing. The opposite side is using it for something else. They have different goals. You know, some say only use NDE, religious or Christian NDEs that fit the Bible. And the other ones are saying, don't say God, don't say Jesus, or we won't include you in this organization. So, you know, some's against church. They're against religion. They're telling people there's reincarnation and there's just meditate. And the other person say, no, prayer. And there's God and there's Jesus. And so they're, they're, they're opposite spectrums. And it can get nasty because I have been in the middle of these for the past decade. So um, everybody knows where I stand. Well but now so but the one thing they I, assumed other things i'm like whoa that is not where i'm at so yeah so that's one of the arguments i've had with the near-death experience especially with uh so here's a here's so i wanted to challenge everyone's beliefs and one of the things i wanted to challenge was unconditional love a lot of people talk about the near-death experience the the thing that comes up a lot is when you're in that space, you are awash in unconditional love. And I remember feeling that feeling and thinking, I don't deserve this. And the thought I got back was, well, of course you deserve this. I'm like, no, 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 no. And I start going through a grocery list of things. Oh, I cheated on a test in fourth grade. Uh, I lied to my mom and, you know, whatever. And every time I came up with something, it, the, the thought I got back was, I don't care. I still love you. You know what that makes me think but, but, of? But I, <laughs> the but I did this thing and I did that thing. No, yeah. I still love you. And so to challenge that unconditional love, I, I would begin the premise with, we are trying to understand a non-human experience with human brains. And so there's going to be dissonance. And as an example, I created a story of an archangel named Trevor. There is no, I mean, I just totally made this up. But I said, Archangel Trevor's hanging out with the rest of his archangels, drinking beer, hanging out, watching what's going on. God comes down and says, hey, I got an idea. I've got a way to unite humanity in a way that hasn't been done since the dark ages. And it's going to require a villain with a capital V to go down there and scare the shit out of everybody, but it'll motivate humanity and bring them together in a way that is, is uncomparable. The problem is, is that I need someone to be that villain. Trevor's like, nah, I'm up for it. What you got? God says, you need to go down to earth. You're going to be born in a country called Germany, and you're going to be a person named Adolf Hitler. You're going to be the responsible person for over 6 million deaths and an attempted genocide. People will curse your name for the rest of human history. Are you sure you're up for it? It's your plan, God. I trust you. I love you. I'm in. And so to try to get people in the audience to accept that Adolf Hitler was actually an archangel in disguise. I come up, I mean, I, I had a, I have two occasions where people met me in the parking lot and wanted to beat me down for being so sacrilegious. But I said, this is exactly what I'm trying to show you. You are trying to use your human brain to understand a process that is outside human experience. You can't do it. Or if you do it, you have to disassociate from your beliefs and ideology. 
and that's hard to do. I can hear I actually had on this one, video now. <laughs> I've, I've had one, I had one of those people, it took them almost a year, but I ran into this person later on at a metaphysical event at, when I was down in Florida, and they came up to me, and they were just like, I am so, so sorry. And the explanation was, is that they had a great uncle who died in Auschwitz, and they were very emotionally tied to that event, and it formed... I'm sure he wasn't the only person, but it formed a basis of their reality. They were they were so engaged with that story and with that narrative that it became a part of who they are. And so my story was basically negating something they had built a lifetime building. Are, so are, are you saying that? Said, are say, you saying that Adolf Hitler was created to be a villain to help humanity? Is that? Your premise. Yes. That because that is a look, good thing that he existed. Look at look at the look at the positive benefits that came from it. From you World can't. War II. You Everyone can't. nobody can justify that. I won't go there with you. Sorry. Okay. Well, and, and that's fine. Because you see but, the Catholic priest and bless the child, of course everybody thinks that's bad. That doesn't mean all Catholic priests are bad or all religion is bad. But Adolf Hitler, he was needed to, to fix the world. You know, it's just like a weird concept. If you look at the perspective of your body is just a meat suit that you're driving around, if you live for a million years what is one lifetime and 20, 30, 40, 80 years out of that oh, yeah. whole continuum? As in the ears, we come back and we feel like we should make the world a better place. But this person did not make the world a better place. I mean, anybody that would want to argue, as I guess you do, that Hitler somehow made the world a better place is in, unsympathetic to murdered victims of uh, something like that but based on their religion based on where they live. We just watched, um, is it called One Life? Yeah, last night. The guy that saved um, 600, almost 700 um, children from- Oh yeah, this oh, is, was this a guy that was like in a in a theater and like all the people stood up in the theater yes. and, and they were and all descended? Yeah, I saw mm -hmm. that. I, that was very powerful. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I can I could participate in this, too. I mean, my great grandmother was Jewish. I come from German ancestry. Um, it, again, it was part of my narrative growing up as a child. But again, if you have to uh, fall into the premise of that to be here, you have to be an ascended master. Then you have to follow along with the premise that everybody is not just the quote unquote good or bad people. And if but not you, everybody's going to believe that we are all ascended masters. It's just you know if that's what you believe, but not everybody's going to fall into that. Like we are all ascended masters for being here. We're all you know this could be purgatory. Other people would argue this is purgatory to see whether we go to heaven or hell. You know they could argue. There's evidence whatever. for that too. So you know because what I feel uh, this, like this when is, I hear this people is where saying we'll just what you are agree. saying, I feel like they are grooming society to believe that bad is good and good is bad because there's a lot of that going on right now everything's turned around and upside down is against religion is bad people that believe in every in a, that that man is woman woman is man and 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 we all go to heaven on robots what i say that that there's no consequences they want to defund the police. They want, you know, everybody let out of prisons. They want drugs to be legal. They want um, to be able to have sex with children to be legal, sex with animals. They want any, they want a free world where everybody can do what they want. And of course, people are going to resist that are traditional, they're conservative, they have faith. And, and then, so that's where we're at. And it feels like good against evil. Of course, they think we're the evil. We think they're the evil. But this has always been our knowledge of good and evil. And you can't just one day wake up and say, okay, it's this way now. And everybody's, oh, okay, we get it. Which is because you say so, right? Like Hitler, we're good now. No, it just don't work like that. So.
I mean, I'm, I mean, I watched too many of the movies, you know, all the, the kids being killed countries. and lined up and, huh? How else could you bring together all the European countries and America, form the Allied powers, and look at the world after World War II? All the economies exploded. There was an explosion of technology, education, access to education. The middle class was created. Was it oh, horrible? Because Absolutely. Of, oh, because of hell but if you, But if you look at it from God's perspective, who has eternity to work with. You cannot say that is God's perspective because it's your perspective. When I don't believe you're religious. I'm, I'm, I, again, I'm just throwing out ideas. Again, like you were saying the earlier. Horrible ideas. I'm just, I'm I'm just looking. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're like, like, like red flags are going up. Like Hitler, like seriously, you're going to, you're going to say that this was a good thing for humanity, that he was an ascended master and they're all ascended masters. And what a dangerous message because people will hear that and all oh, I can go do the same thing he did. And, and everybody should believe that this is going to somehow work out for the good of everyone, because you're going to end up with people doing crazy stuff to hurt a whole lot of people when they start hearing messages like that and don't completely understand them. Are there lessons within crazy stuff? I'm not even going to justify teach? Hitler. I'm not going to justify Hitler whatsoever. Okay, fine. Let's put that aside. But we're going to put it aside. Can you Thank learn you. something by doing crazy stuff? If you touch a hot stove, do you learn to not touch the hot stove a second time? But that's not what you were saying. You were saying that's why I said let's set that aside. Well, it's really kind of hard now. Let's compart can, because, can you, can you compartmentalize like that? So <laughs> we're going to agree to disagree. <laughs> okay. okay. I personally believe that a negative incident can create a positive outcome. Okay. So that that's and you're not buying it. <laughs> and you're not buying it. That's fine. Well, in other in other instances. Surgery, in other instances, but not in that, not in what the one you were just talking about. So we talk yeah, about surgery where, as I can see where Ions loves that because I know what they're about. I know what their agenda is. We I can see about, where Ions loves it. Okay. Fine. Yeah. I'm done talking. Okay. Well, thank you. And I'll send this out to you later. Bye. Bye.